Welcome to Polar Bear, Bears International Tundra Connections Program. We're live here with you from church, just outside of Churchill, Manitoba, on Buggy One. Uh, sorry for the delay getting to you guys. We had a few technical issues, but uh, fortunately for us, we had the master of, of everything, BJ, who took care of our details for us. We appreciate all the hard work getting us live. Um, I'm joined here today by um, Alyssa McCall and Steve um, Aust. Yeah. Amstrup. Amstrup. I'm sorry. I apologize. So uh, they're going to be talking to us a little bit about polar bears and what they know about polar bears. Uh, today, our focus is really not just about learning about polar bears, but also what you can do to have a great impact on polar bears for their lifelong learn, um, opportunities to continue their, to strive in the area here outside of Churchill, Manitoba and other areas in the world. So we're going to be talking about you know, not only how you can help polar bears, but also kind of what you can do to kind of reduce um, your carbon footprint as well. There's a couple of details that I want to cover for you guys. There's a chat window here, so feel free to put, put questions in the chat window. You can also email questions to questions at, at pbears.org, and we'll share them during the webcast. So feel free to put questions out there for us to answer as you go. Uh, my name, again, is Brad Fountain. I work with Discovery Education. And we're going to, you know, our theme today is Paws Up for Polar Bears. And keeping with that theme, we're going to ask you a few questions. And so when you're ready to ask some qu answer some questions, put your paws high in the air so everyone in your class can see them if you think you know the answer to these questions. And we're going to start with a little fun activity for you guys. So we're going to start off by playing a sound from an animal that makes this area its home. So take a listen to the sound here and see if you can guess what might be the animal that makes the sound. All right, did anyone get it? That was the sound of a beluga whale. So something I did not know coming up here at Churchill the first time was that not only do polar bears make their home here, but beluga whales also make their home. And belugas are amazing creatures. If you haven't had a chance to see them, we're going to show a short little clip here of what beluga whales look like. So that's a great clip, yeah. It's amazing to see those polar bears. And uh, Elisa and Steve, that was right here in the, in the river, correct? From yep. the, that video. So that's an amazing opportunity that's here. So have you ever wondered about those cute, cuddly cubs that you see out there, the polar bears? Uh, you know, how do they grow up to be such large bears? That's something we're going to be focusing in on today is, you know, how do we, how do grow, polar bears continue to grow and what do, what do they eat? So, Alyssa, what is a newborn cub called? We call them a koi for short, and that stands for cub of the year. And we give all polar bears a birthday of January 1st. Wow, fascinating. Yeah. So what do the, the cubs eat? Uh, cubs, when they're first born, they rely mostly on their mother's milk. Wonderful. Okay. And you know, how, how much do they grow in, in that, during that first year period? Polar bears grow really quickly when they're first born. So when a cub or koi is born, it is about a pound to a pound and a half. And by the time it's a year old, it can be 80 pounds or maybe more. So they grow almost 80 times in the span of a year. Wow. So if, from a perspective of a human, we're thinking the baby's born at 7 pounds, they go at the same rate, they'd be 560 pounds? Yeah, that's pretty crazy. That is amazing. So what is it that makes, you said, that makes them grow so quickly? Yeah, so their mother's milk is so rich. They get lots and lots of calories and it helps them grow really fast. So, you know, I think one of the things you talked about was a comparison to the milk to something that we might be familiar with from our homes. Mm hmm, exactly. So, the milk that we drink at home, or maybe you guys drink at home, might be skim milk, which has just a little bit of fat, uh, or maybe whole milk, which has 2 to 3 percent fat, and polar bear milk has 30 percent fat, so it's more like drinking whipping cream. Wow, that's fascinating. So, that really helps them to grow and, and develop very quickly. Mm hmm. So, you know, after that first year, what are they called? Once they hit a year old, we call them a yearling. Wow, okay. Yeah. And what is the differences? So, Steve, what would you say are the differences between a cub of the year and a yearling? What, what things do they do differently? Well, uh, aside from being larger, yes. because they're <laughs> continuing to grow, uh, yearlings spend more effort actually trying to hunt. So a cub of the year will get almost all of its nutrition from its mother. But as yearlings, they are catching... Uh, starting to catch some of their own prey, although they're not nearly as effective as when they get older, but also they uh, will feed on the meat, 
the, the seal remains from uh, the kills that their mother makes. So not only are they still getting some milk, but they're also feeding on more meat. Although they start feeding on meat very early during their early years, or their early part of their life, they're uh, relying mainly on, on uh, meat. And, I mean, on, on milk. On milk, yes. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but uh, they're also more independent. So one of the things that we would see in Alaska when we'd be flying out over the ice looking for bears is you'd come on a family group, and if it was a female with cubs, even if the, the cubs of the year were getting older, it was later in the year, when they would hear the helicopter, they'd right away run to their mother. And a lot of times when it was a yearling, you'd see them, and they'd go all different directions. Oh, really? Yeah, because they weren't quite as, so, quite as strongly attached to their mother. So behavioral difference, size differences, and what they eat. Interesting. That's fascinating. So... I don't know if, um, BJ, if you don't mind, you mind showing a little bit of the area that we're around right now? So we're right outside, uh, you know, in, in the Hudson Bay area. And Steve, would you tell us a little bit about why the polar bears come to this area? Well, Hudson Bay is part of the area where the ice melts entirely in the summer. Uh, in some parts of the Arctic, we have what we call multi-year ice. And that's ice that will survive the summer melt season, and then it's thicker the next year. Mm -hmm. But here... For as long as humans can remember, the ice has always melted entirely, and that forces the bears ashore. Okay. And they come ashore along the western coast of Hudson Bay, and at the, in the fall of the year, they start to aggregate here, waiting for the ice to freeze again. They spend the summer kind of lounging around in a pretty broad area up and down the coast. But if you look at the coastline here near Churchill, there's a little bit of a step in it. So it's a north-south coastline. And then there's a little bit of a step here, and that step is one of the first places that catches the new ice in the fall. And so these bears have been on land, not feeding, for potentially a couple, three months, and uh, they're hungry. So they want to go to the place where the ice forms first, and right off here is one of the first places for, where the ice freezes in the fall. So they tend to gradually collect here during the course of the fall, and a large component of the population is right here, right now, waiting for that ice to freeze. Well, that's amazing. So let's give a little perspective for you guys, if we can. Uh, if you're thinking about maybe wondering, where's Hudson Bay? Where's Churchill, Manitoba? So first off, think about where your city is that you're living right now, um, whether it's in the, you know, somewhere in the southeast or whether it's in California, wherever you happen to be. Think about where you are right now, and we're going to show you kind of where we are with, in relation to that, do a little image that we have here to give you an idea where Churchill, Manitoba is. So right there, you see the point, and it's a nice little peninsula there, right there um, in northern Manitoba. Right on the bay there, in the, in Hud, on the Hudson Bay. It's an amazing you know, area out here. That if you've noticed some of the scenery behind us, and as well when we did the camera earlier, you notice the ground's already frozen. Last night we had an amazing little squall come in, so we had you know, snow blowing around. It's really fascinating to see. And Is this typical for this time of year for you guys? Yeah, this is usually uh, starting to cool down right around now. For the last few years, we haven't had snow uh, before Halloween, so it's kind of nice that it's already white mm -hmm. at the moment. Uh, but yeah, over time, it is getting warmer in this area, so historically, it's a bit warmer now than it was, say, three decades ago. That's amazing. Mm -hmm. And, you know, Steve, you've worked in all kinds of areas, right? You've worked not just here in Churchill, but where else have you worked? Well, I did most of my research in northern Alaska, and so that's the area that I'm most familiar with. And it is quite different than, than the area around here in, in a number of ways. Uh, one, you know, I, I spoke a moment ago mm -hmm. about the, the multi-year ice versus yes. the annual ice, the seasonal ice. And in Alaska, historically, the polar bears stayed out on the ice all summer because wow. there was ice there that persisted throughout mm -hmm. the summer melt period. And that ice remained over the productive waters where polar bears could hunt. Uh, now, with a, a warmer environment, as, as uh, humans have continued to warm our environment, the ice has been less and less persistent. And so now, in those areas where I used to work, uh, and where there was ice all summer long, there's no longer any ice. In fact, uh, I used to be able to stand on the north sh slope of Alaska, like in Barrow or Prudhoe Bay. In the middle of the summer, I could look out and I could see the ice. It was just right there. And if I was lucky, I might even see a polar bear out there hunting for seals. Now, the ice is hundreds of miles offshore. It's beyond the curvature of the Earth. You can't see it, even with the most powerful wow. telescope. So, uh, uh, 
And I think that uh, you asked about some of the differences, but yes. one of the main similarities is regardless of whether it's a polar bear that lives here in this seasonal ice environment or one that lives in an area where historically there was multi-year ice, those bears all depend on the ice for catching their prey. They feed mainly on ringed and bearded seals, and they can only catch them from the surface of the ice. So okay. they, don't, they don't catch them on land. They can't swim around in the water. Polar bears are good swimmers, but they're not as good as swimmers as seals are, for example. Awesome. So we're going to get to our um, second stage of development here in just a second, but we want to take a couple questions that we have already coming in. So some of the folks have asked, um, you know, for you, Steve, you mentioned them earlier, but re if you don't mind repeating, how many years have you been studying polar bears? Well, I was in charge of polar bear research in Alaska for 30 years, from 1980 to 2010. And then uh, when I left that job, I joined Polar Bears International. And every year since then, I've been coming up to Churchill. And in fact, I was volunteering for <laughs> Polar Bears International before I left the USGS in Alaska. So uh, I think this is my 12th year up here. Great. And Elisa? Yeah, I've been studying polar bears in this area since 2010, so just over seven years. And I, too, came up here first with Polar Bears International. And, yeah, now I work for them, and that's it's great. That's amazing. Yeah. Um, so one, another question that we've got here is, um, and we'll talk a little bit about th their ability to swim here a little bit, but someone asked a question, do you have any idea how long a polar bear can hold its breath? Um, you know, I, I, I have a statistic in mind, and I think it's around three minutes. It is, yeah. Uh, but uh, do you remember that I do, that yeah. Um, they're, they documented polar bears diving for seaweed in Norway, in and Norway, a bear yeah. held its breath for three minutes and ten seconds. Wow. Mm -hmm. So that's, a, that's a, quite a, a stretch there. So we're going to go now. Hopefully everyone's ready for our second sound effect. So again, keeping that idea that pause up for polar bears, put your hands high in the air if you think you know the sound that we're going to be playing here next. All right, so did anyone have any guess on that one? So that's one that would have been throwing me completely because I'm not from the area here. That's actually a ptarmigan. So if you're not sure what a ptarmigan looks like, this is what a ptarmigan looks like. Be a great spelling question for, for one of the teachers out there if you can get students to spell the word ptarmigan. So once you move beyond the, that yearling status, what's the next stage of development for, for polar bears? Steve? Well, we call them sub-adults. Okay. And these are kind of like the teenagers of the bear world. So they're, they're independent. They, at, at two years of age, or about two and a third years of age, they leave their mother, and then they're out on their own. And uh, whatever they haven't learned from their mother, they have to figure out on their own. And that's actually a pretty tough time. Uh, these bears are the, are the kinds of bears that are most likely to get into trouble with people if they're around a community mm -hmm. uh, because partly they're exploring and partly because they might be hungry. Uh, it's a time that they're really tested and although the statistics on it aren't as good as for some other parts of the uh, population, we know that this is a tough time for survival. That uh, These animals have to figure out how to catch seals how to make their way out here in this environment that looks more like the surface of the moon than, than environments that most of us are, accompany, or are, are, are accustomed to. And uh, so this is a tough time, but by the time they're five years of age, then we call them adults. Okay. They've come through that period where uh, uh, they've made it on their own. They've figured out how to catch seals and uh, how many seals they need to catch in order to make a living and continue to grow. And so by the time they're five or six, they've entered that adult category. And then, actually, they are very secure in their environment, and uh, their survival rate is quite high uh, when they get to that age. Wow. I wish I, with a teenage daughter of my own, I would love it, it was five-year period. That would be great. <laughs> you know, it would be a lot easier. So one of the things that, uh, you know, I was curious about with, uh, you know, you talked about them getting into trouble. Now, Lisa, you, you all had an interesting uh, in, uh, encounter, I guess would be the right way to say it, in uh, Churchill recently. Is that right? Can you tell a little bit about that? I think we have a nice little photo that maybe we can show from the uh, yeah. actual encounter. Yeah, sure. So Churchill, Manitoba, of course, being right where these polar bears live, sometimes polar bears wander a little too close to town or even into town. And this summer at the home that Polar Bears International bases itself out of in Churchill, uh, we had a visitor right on our doorstep. Luckily, nobody was home, <laughs> and people were there right away to help 
you know, turn the bear in a better direction. <laughs> um, but we did get some funny photos, and if we can't pull it up now, uh, then we can definitely post it later. That's but, fine. Yeah. yeah, if we don't have it, that's unexpected fine. visitor. Oh, yeah. Unexpected visitor. Yeah. So it's a, it's they'll post a picture up later on. It's actually amazing. The bear pretty much right at your front door. Is that right? Yep. Exactly. So, <laughs> yeah, I'm not sure how comfortable I'd be in that situation. Mm -hmm. So you talked a little bit, Steve, about you know this the development of that during that young adult period. Um, what are some of the things that the polar bears are doing that are um, maybe you know reminiscent or, or modeling after what kids would do or teenagers might do? What are some of the activities or actions? Well, polar bears live a long time, mm -hmm. and so one of the most important things that a growing bear has to do is explore its environment, figure out where there's rewards mm -hmm. and where there might be penalties. Where you know is the ice too thin to support it? Can I walk on that ice? Mm -hmm. What kind of ice has seals in it that I can uh, uh, catch and sustain myself? Mm -hmm. And so they're out there trying to learn as much as they can because if they don't learn what's good and what's bad, they won't survive. And because they're in that really serious exploratory period, that's part of the reason that these younger bears are the ones that are most likely to get into trouble and come to the doorstep at PBI. I mean, they might see that PBI sticker on the window, but that isn't what's good for them. That's right. And uh, so, but that's part of the issue is they're out there exploring and learning. And, and in many ways, that's what human children are doing. Yes. From the earliest ages, they're exploring their environment and figuring out what, uh, you know, is the wood stove hot? You know, <laughs> yes. it might be, it might not be hot in the summertime, but come wintertime, it's hot and they don't want to touch it. And those are the kinds of things that, that human kids have to learn. That, uh, and similarly, polar bears are exploring their environment and learning the same kinds of things. I think we had an interesting clip too that was, I don't know if um, BJ can pull it up with, you know, kind of, some people might think the bears fight. But I think we have a clip of something. What do you, how do you call it? There's something that adolescents do quite a bit. It's what is it? The I think we have it here. Yeah. The, well, it's called sparring. Uh -huh. Some people will, will say it's boxing or dancing, uh, but uh, this is a, a behavior that mostly occurs in this part of the world. Perhaps because this is a place where, throughout uh, their at least recent evolutionary history, these bears have aggregated here in large numbers okay. without much else to do. You know, there's not much food on the land, so they're not out actively hunting. They can't go offshore because it's open water, and they know they can't catch any food there. So it gives them an opportunity to get to know each other a little bit. And, and I think the, the prevailing hypothesis is that that sparring activity gives bears a sense of who's the strongest, who's the best fighter, who's, uh, who's dominant. Mm -hmm. And it gives them an opportunity to make those assessments in a time when it isn't really important for their livelihood or their survival. Because later on, in the spring of the year, mm -hmm. uh, male bears fight seriously over mates. And so if, if a couple of males come together and uh, they remember, oh yeah, I was wrestling with that guy or sparring with that guy in the fall and he's tougher than I am. I'm not going to challenge him. Um, and that can avoid serious injuries. And polar bears do occasionally uh, get serious injuries from these fights in the spring of the year. But it's thought that the sparring in the fall might help head off some of that uh, uh, dangerous interaction. Now, with, with our theme around the, the positive for polar bears, I think one of the things that, uh, I think, if I'm remembering correctly, something you told me earlier, the paws have something to do with how bears tell who's who. Is that right? As far as a, a scenting or something with, related to it? Mm -hmm. Elisa, can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so in the spring, uh, when females are maybe getting ready to try to have babies, they can release um, a special scent through their paws, and they leave a scent trail as they walk across the ice, and that's one way that males can find females out in the middle of nowhere over this huge expanse of ice. If they sniff out some smelly footprints, uh, then they'll follow them for quite a long time yeah. until they, you know, find a new friend. Wow, mm -hmm. oh, that's yeah. amazing. We, in Alaska, we did, uh, uh, we participated in a study with the uh, San Diego Zoo where we collected samples and sent them down to the zoo, and we took Q-tips and extracted the toe jam. <laughs> from polar bears to, to test for that scent. And we sent those Q-tips down to San Diego, and then they exposed the bears in their zoo to uh, the different the, the Q-tips that came from different kinds of bears. So males, females, females that had cubs, females that maybe were in heat and ready to breed. And uh, 
uh, they found that the bears could indeed distinguish those. And so it was, it was proof, in a sense, of something that we, in our observations, had always thought but hadn't really figured out exactly how bears might be doing it. And uh, so that was really quite a remarkable finding. And it also has important ramifications for the future because these bears are breeding in the spring. And so the male, it's important that the males can find the females in the spring out on the ice. And as the ice becomes thinner and less stable, it's more fractured. So you can kind of think of bears walking around on a jigsaw puzzle that's coming apart. Hmm. And when that jigsaw puzzle comes apart, how do they follow those tracks? Yes. So that's one more concern that we have about what the impact of uh, global warming and the changing sea ice that results from it might be. Fascinating. Now, a little off of what we were talking about a minute ago, but. One of the things you meant, you talked about uh, the other day was, you know, people think about polar bears being these massive creatures. They grow, get to about what size, Steve or Elisa? Well, the the, lar the, la the largest adult males can be 1,200 pounds okay. or more, and um, females are typically about half that. And you know, so people think about the ice. You talk about the ice and it breaking apart, and you think about, you know, you're, as an adult, a child or an adult, you're told don't walk on the ice. But the bears are out there walking all the time. How do they? that animal weighing that much keep from falling in? Well, part of it is those juveniles we were talking about, <laughs> the subadults figured it out. But uh, they have these massive big paws, so even though they're heavy, they have four feet instead mm -hmm. of two. They're really big feet. And uh, uh, they also are able to use kind of their whole body. So you'll see them if the ice gets really thin, they'll kind of spread out their legs and even kind of scoot along on their <laughs> bellies to try and uh, keep from breaking through. It turns out that even though they're good swimmers, uh, polar bears would prefer to walk on the ice than break through and swim. It's just more energetically okay. intensive for them to okay. have to swim. Uh, but the combination of the experience, learning how to walk on thin ice, and the big feet, and the strategies of you know spreading their legs and maybe actually dragging themselves along on their belly. Wow, that's fascinating. So just to kind of disperse their whole weight everywhere they can. To get moving across. Um, one thing I mentioned to ask you earlier, Lisa, I don't know if we have it. Did we bring the bear spray up? I can, yes. Ah, so when in town, Elisa, what are the, you know, one of the things that we they talk about, and I got the experience to, to do this myself when I walked in town, uh, you have to keep an eye out for polar bears in the area. Mm -hmm. And so, Elisa, tell, tell a little bit about what we've got here. Sure. So uh, we actually talk to kids about how to stay safe in polar bear country, too. And we call this uh, one of our bear scare tools. So if you live in polar bear country or even in other bear country, you need to take precautions. So you need to be careful to make sure that if you see a bear, uh, you have a safe way to get back home. And this is one of the precautions we have. It's just like a pepper spray. So um, you can spray it at the bear, sting its eyes and its mouth, and it gives you a chance to back away and get out of there and send the bear in another direction. Fascinating. Yeah. So, and you carry that around pretty much whenever you leave or if you're walking alone? Yeah. At time, right? Yeah, if, if, we, if there's any chance we're going to run into a bear, it's no problem to pop this in a backpack or on our hip, and it's better safe than sorry. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah, and Brad, I would add that mm -hmm. yes. this is not just a valuable tool for polar bears. Okay. For a lot of the viewers here might live in places where there's black bears or grizzly yes. bears, and this is a really effective protection from the other bears as well. Really? If you're out hiking in wild areas, in the forest near your home, or away from your home, um, this is a really good tool to have. And, uh, you know, some people will carry a gun to protect mm -hmm. themselves from bears. And what we found, statistics have shown, one of our colleagues here actually has studied this intensively, and shown that statistically you're much more effective defending yourself from a bear with pepper spray really? than you are uh, with a gun. And why would that be? Well, for one thing, you're going to be nervous if a bear is charging <laughs> yes. you. And uh, if you think about this, this sprays a cloud that might be several feet across by the time it gets to the bear. Whereas if you're trying to shoot it with a rifle or a pistol, you have a, yeah. about that much chance of hitting it. So compare a, a cloud of, of stinging powder <laughs> that's several feet across versus something yes. that's a half inch across. And uh, it's, it's been shown to be very effective on all of the bear species. Wow. So you'd, something you'd highly recommend just for anybody who's hiking out in the woods, just keep it in an area that has bears. If they're in, if they're bear, in bear country. I, I don't go hiking anywhere uh, in bear country without pepper Wow, that's, that's great advice. I love it. 
So we're gonna. Are we ready for our third sound effect? So what we'd like to do before we move into the old stilt stage, just take a look at another sound effect. Remember that pause up. We'll get our pause up for polar bears. Raise your hand if you think you know the answer to the sound that you're gonna hear now. Who got that one? All right. If you got polar bear cub, you got that one right. I think that's probably the only one I would have gotten right so far. So um, if you're with me, feel good about it. It's all right. Um, but so polar bear cubs, and you know they live in this area. You know something that we see quite. You know you see quite regularly, right? Um, throughout the area. Yeah, yeah, at this time of year, we occasionally see moms and cubs. Uh, they tend to hang out a little more inland, so we are uh, very fortunate when they do make their way over here. But we have a couple moms and cubs in this general area right now. We know that. Awesome. So what, while you're talking about the polar bears that live in the area, so one of the questions that we got earlier that I want to try to address is, how many polar bears would you say live in this general area? Well, you know, the western Hudson Bay population is where we are right now, and there's roughly 900 bears in the whole population, but we're in a really small area of that. And it's really hard to say at any one point because a lot of the bears that we're going to see are moving through the area. And on a given day, we might see anywhere from 1 to even 15 bears sometimes. Um, so, you know, it's, they're constantly moving, and it's hard to pinpoint how many are right here. Wow. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, Steve, up in, in Alaska, how, what was the population like up there? Well, the, the population in Alaska had been declining dramatically during, during the uh, last decade or so. And uh, historically, we estimated there was 1,500 or 1,800 in that population in what we called the southern Beaufort mm -hmm. Sea. It occurs along the northern coast of Alaska. Uh, but that population had declined by about 40% in the first decade of the, wow. uh, of the 2000s. So uh, uh, not looking good up in that area. So that leads me right into a question we got here from uh, Winnipeg Room 105. So thank you, Winnipeg Room, Room 105, for sending this. So they know snow and ice are important to polar bears. What can students do in grade one, two, or three? You know, that early grades. What could they do, whether it's in their environment, within their school, within their homes, to have a positive impact um, for the polar bears? Well, you know, I think Elisa should answer that question right. because she's, she's very familiar with some of the programs that well, EDI has to... Uh, well, let's pass it over uh, to Elisa. Great, yeah. Elisa. Sure, yeah, there's a lot you guys can do uh, no matter what grade you are. And it's important to remember that anything that is good for the environment is good for polar bears. So if we reduce the amount of fuel that we use, that's the biggest thing. That really helps polar bears. So when we burn fuel, we release emissions into the air and emissions trap heat. And if we trap too much heat and thicken that heat trapping blanket, it's not good for sea ice because we all know that when we have a slushy drink in the summer, it melts when it gets too hot. So we can do things like we can bike to school or walk to school in a group of friends. Maybe you can carpool more often. Uh, you can work within your own school to maybe start a recycling program turned off when you don't need them anymore. We have a lot of different ideas on our website and if you guys are interested in doing a big project there's a couple ways you can get involved with Polar Bears International. We are about to kick off our project Polar Bear so any classroom across Sign up in a group with a teacher or leader, and you can come up with a cool project in your town or in your school, and we support you through that and stay in touch with you for months, and any way that you can reduce emissions in your school is great. So one cool example we have is that one classroom a couple years ago redesigned their school bus route, and were able to take one or two buses totally off the road and still pick up all the kids. So we thought that was pretty cool. So check out Project Polar Bear online if you want to get involved. That's just one of the very many any ways that you can make a difference no matter what age you are. Oh, great information. And, uh, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, and, and I would add one thing to that is uh, every student that we're talking to now can go home and suggest to your parents that they contact their elected mm -hmm. leaders and ask them to take action to stop global warming. Whether it's your member of parliament, if you're in Canada, or your local legislator, or your senator, or member of the House of Representatives in the U.S., Whatever your elected leaders are, they need to get the message that we want to save polar bears and we want to save their sea ice habitat. Wonderful. So another question I want to address real quickly before we move into adulthood. Um, what other species depend on uh, the polar bears in the ecosystem? How do those, the other species interact or what um, kind of connections do they have? 
Well, uh, probably the, the most obvious connection <laughs> is that polar bears eat seals. seals. And so uh, uh, I don't know that the seals depend very much on polar bears, <laughs> but the polar bears definitely depend on the seals. And in fact, you can kind of think about it is ever since polar bears evolved and moved out onto the sea ice to start hunting seals, there's been kind of an arms race where the polar bears are trying to figure out the best ways to catch the seals, mm -hmm. and the seals are trying to figure out the best <laughs> ways to stay away from polar bears. And we see that out here. Uh, seals are mammals that have hair, and they periodically have to molt. But when they're in the very cold Arctic waters, they can't molt. So in the spring of the year, when the sun comes up, we see seals basking on the surface of the ice. And part of the reason they do that is so that the sun can warm up their skin, increase blood flow to the skin, and allow them to molt and develop a new, uh, a new coat of hair, just like your dog or cat at home sheds its fur and, and grows a new coat. And uh, so when these seals are basking, of course, they're kind of vulnerable to polar bears that are hunting around for them, and not quite as secure as when they're in the water. Uh, so they're always vigilant. And you could look at a ring seal out there, and it looks like it's sleeping, but every minute or so it'll pop its head up and look around. And they're looking around for polar bears. So that's one of the most uh, interesting uh, interactions, I think. Mm -hmm. Uh, but there's lots of other creatures around here, and just this morning we were watching yes. a, a black phase or silver phase of a red fox catching lemmings and uh, voles out here. And, and so this tundra area, even though it doesn't look like there might be much life out here, has a rich supply of small mammals that support foxes and raptorial birds like hawks and uh, owls. And uh, so there's other species here that may not have a direct connection to uh, polar bears, but uh, uh, are supported by the same environment. And, uh, you know, when we talk about the relationship between seals and polar bears, often polar bears don't eat the whole seal. And so the remains uh, will support foxes that follow the polar bears around. Uh, the arctic fox, the little white fox, actually kind of follows the polar bear around like jackals follow lions in Africa and scavenge on the prey. And so there is a, a kind of a support network that's built from that interaction between the bears and the seals. It's definitely fascinating to see that whole food chain work together mm -hmm. to have a sustainable environment out there. That's amazing. And we should add that um, no, even if some animals aren't dependent on polar bears, the Arctic ecosystem is dependent on the ice, and sea ice is to the ocean what soil is to the forest. It forms the base of the food chain. Things grow inside of it and feed everything all the way up to polar bears, so the whole Everything really does still need sea ice. That's a yeah. no, great point, great point. So going on to our, uh, keeping our theme of kind of that developmental stage of polar bears, mm -hmm. next stage, is it fair to say that that final stage is the adulthood stage? Steve? Sure. Yeah. So, so what, is, what would be a typical day for polar bear, both during this time of year, but also d once the ice freezes? So what, those two different dis distinctions for now, if we're in, in, in the conditions we are right now, but then also later on in the year when the, the ice is frozen, mm -hmm. what would be a typical day for a polar bear? Well, a typical day around here for most of these bears is uh, that they're laying in the bushes or in the kelp resting. <laughs> and uh, so they make a nice little bed, they snuggle up, and they're just trying to conserve energy because they have been food deprived for three months approximately. And so this is a long time. I mean, think about it. Yeah, I don't want to miss lunch in yeah, three exactly. months. It's going to be a whole so, different issue. So think about not eating for three months. Polar bears are very well adapted to an extended period of food deprivation, an extended period when they just don't have anything to eat. But there is a limit to that. Mm -hmm. And when they're here, for the most part, they just want to save energy. And uh, so we saw the pictures of the sparring bears earlier. Yes. Bears won't be sparring if they don't have enough energy to do it. So they have made kind of an assessment in their own bodies that, uh, you know, I've got the energy to spare to learn something else about my life that may benefit me later. But we've seen a lot of interactions here where one bear will come up to another bear, like testing it, like he mm -hmm. wants to spar, and that bear is not interested, and he'll just let that other bear know and either chase him off or growl at him or whatever. Uh, so, you know, they're mostly resting here. They do do that sparring activity. Um, and then once the ice comes in, boom, they're out and they're hunting for seals right away because they're pretty doggone hungry. 
So and then they spend the rest of their the rest of the year out on the ice mm -hmm. hunting for seals. And it turns out that the dark of the winter is a tough time for them. So they, they do catch seals during that time of year, but it's not the best time. So they're out there, they, they maybe make a little hay, mm -hmm. catch quite a few seals in the fall, but then the really harsh winter time, um, you know, they probably spend a lot of time kind of huddled in, protecting themselves from the harsh weather. But then when the sun comes back in the spring and the ice starts to open up a little bit, things are more active, and then they really feed. And in this part of the world especially, that's when they really put on the weight. So they can put on, I think it is four kilograms a day, is that right? Something when they're like that. when they're out there feeding on uh, now that doesn't mean that they catch seal after seal after seal, but they're catching enough of them that they're gaining four kilograms or about ten pounds a day. So uh, you know, I mean probably very few kids in the audience can even appreciate mm -hmm. gaining ten pounds a day. Uh, but they're doing that in the spring because they've got to be as fat as they can be before they're forced ashore and then have to go without food for another three months or more. Now, are the females doing the same kind of activity then right now? Or, um, like, when is their dinning period for, for p female polar bears? In this part of the world, uh, you know, the, the sea ice melts entirely in the summer. All the bears come ashore. Mm -hmm. The females that are pregnant, they bred in the spring, they're pregnant, they go inland and go into the denning areas, and they'll actually tunnel into the earth and create an earthen den Wow. And it's cool in there. They'll be right against the permafrost. It keeps the bugs away. And they just rest, waiting for the snow to come. And then when the snow comes and covers up the lair, they'll move out, migrate out into the snow. But in this part of the world, I think it's around Thanksgiving time, around the 1st of December or thereabouts, mm -hmm. that, uh, that they have their cubs. Is that right, Elisa? Yeah, sometime in December. And I mentioned before we give them the birthday of January 1st, but that's to make our lives easier. <laughs> yeah, really, they're born probably in December. So. Yeah, I mean, if we had to have a birthday party for every day, <laughs> you know, we, oh. but, but, you know, the, we can no have cakes, just one right? birthday party. Yeah. You know? No cakes? So, you don't bring cakes out to each yeah. one? Mm -hmm. No, unfortunately. Uh, yeah. They probably so, prefer a seal cake. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So the, the female will stay then in the den with these cubs. And as Elisa pointed out earlier, they're born at about a pound or a pound and a half. They're blind. They're almost naked. And they're totally helpless. And they don't look like what we think of as baby bears. Mm -hmm. They don't look anything like this. <laughs> and, uh, but uh, they grow very rapidly. They drink that very rich mother's milk that Elisa was talking about earlier. And then by the end of February, early March in this part of the world, uh, they emerge from the den with the mother and they look like baby bears that we think of as baby bears. And then they go back out onto the ice. Now in Alaska, where I did most of my work, everything is a little bit later. Okay. So the, the bears are indeed born around the first of the year. And then they emerge from the den in uh, uh, late March, early April, and sometimes even into mid-April. Great. So I, well, I know we're getting close to the end of our time. One of the questions I do want to address, I think mm -hmm. we'll work with our props that we have right here, mm -hmm. Lisa, is um, they were, the question came out is, you know, how do how have a polar bears adapted to the area? So can you talk a little bit about maybe the fur and some of the other adaptations they've had? Absolutely, yes. Yeah. So this is a subject we could talk about for a long time. So I'll just point out a couple things, and there's a lot more great information on our website. So, of course, one of the major adaptations that's very obvious when you see a polar bear is its fur. So it blends in with the sea ice. Their fur is actually hollow and colorless, but to us it mostly looks white. And they've got two layers of fur to keep them nice and warm. So they have a very thick, dense layer right against their skin, and then they have a longer guard hair over top. And so this is like they're wearing a sweater with a thick raincoat over top. And this keeps them really nice and warm in the very cold Arctic. Uh, some other cool adaptations, of course, Steve has already talked quite a bit about the paws, many different reasons they've got nice big paws. They also have kind of sticky paws, so it helps them grip the sea ice. And winter tire companies have even used the polar bear paw as a model to make better That's tires. Fascinating. We can also take a quick look at their claws. So here, I'll hold it up against this for a better background. But you can see their claws are very sharply thick and curved. And Steve has a brown bear claw there. So you, oh, here we go. So the brown bear claw is on top. It's longer and thinner. And the polar bear claw is here. And you can see the polar bear claw is much more suited for grabbing seals and pulling them out of the water, whereas the brown bear claw is more suited for land and maybe digging up roots and um, 
you know, whatever might be in the ground. And then just really quickly, let's take a look at our skull friend over here. So polar bears have nice big teeth for biting seals. Uh, so the big jaws, big head, and they're able to get their mouth right over a seal head. There you go. Steve's going to help me articulate this thing. Uh, and they can pull the seals right out of the water. You can see those big canines. So if any of you have a dog at home, you know that your dog has nice big front teeth, but these are just a little bit bigger for their seal prey. Um, and of course, polar bears can smell very well. They've got a lot of structures in their nose there that help them pick up the wind and they can smell way better than we can. Uh, so check out our website for a lot more about polar bear adaptations um, and for more information about their skulls and fur and claws. So Elise, I know we've got to wrap up here in just a minute, but can you tell teachers and students a little more about how they can stay involved with Polar Bears International? Absolutely. So we have an education center on our website, so please check that out with your parents or your teachers. And right now there's a few ways you can get involved. I mentioned Project Polar Bear. Please go ahead and sign up for that. And we also run campaigns all through the year to ask kids to get involved. Uh, one cool thing we're doing right now is our Flat Nanook. And so you can go online and find our Flat Nanook. You can print him out and cut him out. He's a little polar bear with a sign, and we'll be posting examples later. And you can write whatever you want on Flat Nanook's sign. And we would love it if, with permission from your mom or dad, um, if you would take a photo of yourself wherever you live in the world or at a really cool place with your Flat Nanook. And on Polar Bear Day in February, so months from now, but we are going to showcase all the kids around the world with their flat nooks, and that would be so cool if you would take part. And also teachers, we would really appreciate it if you could fill out our feedback survey. If you registered for this event, you'll get an email with the link, or you can find the link elsewhere on our page. For everyone who fills out the feedback survey, you'll be given a link to online resources that aren't currently available on our website, including a polar bear safety coloring book, which is pretty fun. And everyone who does the survey will be entered into a draw for a polar bear adoption. So your classroom can win a polar bear adoption. You'll get one of these guys to be your classroom mascot. And you'll also get a magazine and a couple cool other little things. So please do fill out that survey online. Um, it helps us out a lot when we're looking at our programming. Awesome. I really appreciate it, Alyssa. So I know Polar Bears International's goal is to kind of keep polar bears in the Arctic always, right? Absolutely. And, you know, for the time that remains, we want to make sure that, you know, anything that students can do, they can find a lot of great resources on your website mm -hmm. on how to help protect the habitat that exists here in Churchill, Manitoba, but also in other parts of the world that are in the environment of polar bears. Is that correct? Yeah, we know that together we can definitely keep polar bears into the Arctic forever, but we need everyone's help and we can all do our part uh, to keep sea ice on the oceans and polar bears hunting seals. And please, teachers, take the moment to go ahead and fill out the post-broadcast survey. It's really important for Polar Bears International to get that feedback um, on you know what the program is, what things they have to offer for you guys, so they can make the best um, opportunities for you guys available. So take them a few minutes and go ahead and complete that survey. As Elisa mentioned, it'll get a, sent to an email to you guys, but also you can find it on the website. So go to polarbearsinternational.org and you can find it right there, right, Absolutely. Elisa? Yep. So thank you to everybody who joined us for the broadcast. Thank you to Steve and to Elisa and and behind the scenes to BJ for doing all his great work. And thank you for all the students and teachers who joined us today. Hope you had a great session, and we thank you from Discovery Education and Polar Bears International. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.